I'll do that. I'll do that first. Yep. 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 All right. Let's go ahead and get. Can we go ahead and get started? All right. Cool. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, everybody. Let's go ahead and start with the roll. We'd like to call this meeting to order. Let's go ahead and start with the roll call. Mayor Bagley. Here. Council members Christensen. Here. Hidalgo Fearing. Here. Martin. Here. Peck. Rodriguez. Here. Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Great. Let's take the pledge. Get sort of a skinny thing this from my chair. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, let's go on. Actually, let's go ahead and move uh, before we start with motions to direct the city manager to add any agenda items or public invited to be heard. Let's go ahead and move city manager comments up. Uh, yes, Mayor. Are the, are the mics on? Hello? Mics yep, on? No, okay. Right. Yes, Mayor, Council. We actually have Dan Eman and Carol Hellick. Carol's with the Boulder County um, Department of Public Health. And um, we know we've had a lot of questions regarding coronavirus, what the city's doing. Dan's going to do a brief presentation. Um, turn it over to Carol, and we just want to be here to answer any questions you all may have because we know that's a topic of conversation in our community. I don't know if that's going to work, but good evening. Uh, <laughs> that's not happening. Look at that. Nicely done, you. I'll get in there. Uh, good evening. My name's Dan Eman. I'm the Assistant Public Safety Chief for the city, and I also oversee the city's Office of Emergency Management. So my purpose here tonight is to just try to give you guys a, an overview of what we're currently doing in response to this uh, COVID coronavirus issue. And um, as Harold mentioned, we also have Carol Helwig here. She's an epidemiologist with Boulder County Public Health. She's far smarter than I am, so ask any question you want of her. Um, so kind of to start out with this um, this thing is so it's a public health led incident and anything that's kind of a epidemic pandemic I guess any kind of demic is really kind of a public health led response because they are the city's public health entity too um, they're countywide we're going to take a lot of our lead from them uh, this is what they do and we have all the cities all the municipalities and the county have come together and decided to respond to this thing as a county. Uh, Harold's on board with this. Um, we've had a couple internal meetings talking about this already. And there's a lot of systems that are already in place and a lot of systems that we're building to respond to this if it gets any bigger. Um, probably the biggest one that's going to have the most impact right away is what's called a joint information system. It's kind of a fancy name for all of the public information teams from all over the county. Um, municipalities, uh, the sheriff's office, commissioner's office, school district, uh, hospital systems, anybody that we can kind of think of that's related to this event in any way um, are coming together with public health to try to create a consistent messaging platform. Because I think all of you know that anybody in our community that spends five minutes on Google right now is going to either come out thinking there's nothing going on, we're going to die tomorrow, and anything in between. So what we're trying to create here is a consistent messaging source that's going out countywide. That's the intent of this joint information system. And uh, Marika is one of the managers of this system along with the City of Boulder representative and they're going to be responsible for making sure all of the entities involved have consistent messaging. That's probably the most critical thing we're doing right now. Uh, we also have a group uh, that started meeting on Monday of all the agency administrators, all the city managers, the elected officials to talk about policy level issues. So we're going to do that weekly. We have the emergency management offices, uh, Longmont, Boulder, are meeting every day with public health, the emergency planners from public health to talk about tactical level things. What do we need to do to support our county departments? What do we need to do to respond to things that are coming up? And we'll continue to do that every day. Um, on a more local basis, our primary communication tool to, from emergency management to the city is what we call a situation report. And we put our first one out today, and they'll go out every day. It's something that we've used in, 
every year. Uh, we use them every year for severe weather season. And it's really a way that we can communicate, here's what we're watching for, here's the information sources we use, here's some trigger points, um, just a way that we can communicate with the city employees of here's what we're watching and always trying to ask what else can we do for you. We have a group that's getting together with the hospital systems. We're expanding that out to the clinics in the, in the next coming weeks to try to support what they're seeing. Um, it's probably going to be one of the initial catch points of things that do come in to the, to the county, uh, making sure the hospital systems are involved in the planning that we do. We're starting to um, think about what members of our community are going to need a little additional support and how we can start communicating with, with them, whether it's homeless, the assisted living facilities, all of those kinds of places. We're starting to lean forward into that planning process too. Um, you probably saw today the uh, uh, Governor Polis declared a state, a public health emergency for the state. Basically for them, that's a vehicle to activate their state emergency operations plan, which activates some state level resources and some dollars for them. It does not make dollars available for us. Uh, we have not done a local state of emergency and we're not anticipating that in the near future, but that's a tool that we can certainly use. That's the overview of what we're currently doing to, um, to think about this, this issue as a city. But I think the big message that, that I want to leave you with is this is a county level incident and we're going to respond to this thing as, as a unified county. This isn't something that's going to just pick Longmont, right? I mean, we're going to need to make sure that this is a, a unified response and that's how we're planning for it. Um, the message that we're giving to our employees is really the same thing we're, we're giving to the community. Wash your hands. If you're sick, stay home. We're asking our managers to send people home if they're sick. Cover your mouth if you're coughing. I mean, it's some pretty simple stuff that we're trying to communicate, and I'm sure Carol will give you much more detail than that, but that's all I have for you. I'd, I'd be happy to take questions for you, um, and I know Carol can give you much more detail on that. Great. Thank you very much. Keep us safe and keep us updated. Or, oh, sorry. Give us something. You're an expert, so say, yeah, say something. Well, how many, how many slides? If it's two slides, yes. If it's oh. 24, no. Oh, well, I'm a communicable disease epidemiologist, and this is like my favorite subject, so I could talk all <laughs> night. Um, but but um, I, I don't know. I could just field your questions, or if you want some visuals, um, we, we do have some slides available. I, I would say that Dan, though, pretty much covered most things in a nutshell. The only thing that he didn't mention is that we are also recommending that all employers, everyone recommend that people get a flu shot. A flu shot is not going to prevent COVID, um, but it can reduce the burden of respiratory illness in our community, and we want to do that as much as possible, anticipating that our healthcare system is likely going to be overwhelmed with people with respiratory illness. Um, and then all those other safety messages that, that Dan m m mentioned. Are, um, there's resources available on the CDC website, uh, like for example, this poster, you can get that on the CDC website very easily. Um, another thing that I'll mention is that we are uh, working with cultural brokers to reach out to the Spanish speaking community and make sure that the messaging that we're getting out there is appropriate and, and um, reaching them and so that we're making sure that we're doing that. Um, I, I don't know what other kind of information you would like to know. Uh, I guess one of the things that's most concerning to us and the reason that we are really trying to scale up to our highest level of activation is that there is community spread in the United States, uh, especially in the, in the uh, state of Washington. Mm -hmm. The community spread there has occurred in people who did not have any connection to any travelers or to any known folks. And once that happens is when we raise our level of uh, preparedness to the highest level because community spread uh, across the country is very possible right now. Possible um, or likely? I would say I don't have a crystal ball, but I would be very surprised if we don't get cases in Boulder County. I would be very surprised if we get through this unscathed. And on that note, 
on that note, wash your hands, get your flu shot, stay home if you're sick, um, and stay tuned. All right, great. Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Dr. Waters. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I don't know what to do with this. Mm. Well, is this on? I don't know. If that, can you pick this up? Mm-hmm. Can everybody hear us tonight? For some reason, it just feels okay. Long ways away. Um, you know, I've got questions like probably everybody else does. Like, what are the thresholds that we reach before certain decisions are made? What are what kind of capacity do we have in our healthcare system, and at what mm-hmm. point? Is it overwhelmed? But those would all, that would be speculation, I suppose. But, but what, what isn't speculation is who makes the calls, right? Uh, we're, I'm involved in a planning process for an event on the 27th of March, where we would like a group of people to come together. The governor's gonna be up here. It's a big deal, focused on early childhood education. So in the back of everybody's mind who's planning, what are the prospects that's gonna be affected in, in, in the real, you know, that's speculation, but who makes the decision whether or not to, to ban or to discourage, I'm not certain, you know, along a continuum, yeah. is there a stage where someone says, and who's the someone that we discourage gatherings, and is there a stage where someone, and who's the someone that says we're banning public gatherings, can't use public facilities to bring people together? So um, I do have a slide that shares our incident management um, structure, and and in and maybe it'll be helpful to pull that up but basically we have a lot of our administrators and policy level decision makers within that structure and so someone like me I would make a recommendation to say as an epidemiologist I recommend that we do this to stop the spread of the disease Uh, but then it's going to be up to the administrators our public health director and everyone jointly to to make that call so it'll be municipality by municipality if it if we're in a municipality it is now it is now Mm -hmm. so generally the way this will work is they'll make so assume somebody tests positive Mm -hmm. they're then going to do their work from an epidemiological standpoint to go what's the risk and they'll go here's what we think we need to do in terms of managing that risk that then goes to the director of their group and then they provide advice to us as administrators in terms of what they're going to recommend doing and and specifically to that question as we've talked through some of this whether it's a school district or it's a city we're all going to be looking to them for guidance because they're also in working in conjunction with the cdc in terms of the protocols they're issuing they then make a decision because they're the only ones that can really for lack of a better word say we need to do a quarantine or here's what we're going to do and so then we will all start responding appropriately based on the advice that we get for them theoretically um, just to, and I'm just going to give you an example this doesn't mean that it's going sure. to happen it's helpful to have so um, what you see in some of the jurisdictions is you, you saw the Washington Department of Health make the recommendation to the Kirkland Fire Department that said you need to quarantine your firefighters in this fire station and they did that so they were working in conjunction with that where it starts getting where there's other decisions for us is let's say theoretically there's students that do this and then they start making and they make a recommendation to the school district we're then going to have to look to that recommendation to go then what does that mean for us in terms of rec centers and some of these other components and so it's really their guidance that will start working us through the process based on the condition that we're dealing with at that given time and evaluating the risk and any number of things so just in terms go ahead uh, i i do also want to state that in uh, statute public health does have the authority to uh, implement actions to control the spread of disease so ultimately the legal authority lies on public health and 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 that is there but but we do want to do this in conjunction with our partners we don't want to make these decisions in a vacuum at some point not right now but at some point in time it'll be helpful to be more specific than public health right Mm -hmm. give us here's the person they make the call it is has the force of law or whatever there's an emergency declared and there's no question there's no it's a director of public health if so, to, we to have our, our public health director is Jeff Zayak, but then we also have the state health department and, and the head of the state health department. And there's also, I don't know what the acronym is, but it's the GERC, 
which is the governor's kind of emergency communicable disease group, and, and they also have levels of authority within this process. Thank you. Okay. All right, anybody else? So, you know what, actually I do. Council Member Rialgo um, Faring. Mm -hmm. So if there was a case in Colorado, would they, uh, would we be able to know which county it is in, what city it's in, or is it just going to be an overall, it, it was in the state of Colorado? There may be different situations that mm -hmm. result in different things. For example, if we have a travel related case yeah. that has not caused any um, potential transmission to the community, we will likely not release the county because there's no risk to the community. But if there's a, a, a case at Longmont High School, mm -hmm. um, then we likely will release that information because we'll likely have to implement public actions in, in accordance to that. So it depends. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That would be all. Thank you so much for your time okay. this evening. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. Let's move on to so anybody want to put anything on the agenda? All right. Seeing no one, let's go ahead and move on to public invited to be heard. Can we get the list? Thank you, thank you. Get a lot of feedback, oh, yeah. please. Can you guys hear that? All right, we have one member of our community here to talk, so hopefully it will be awesome. <laughs> Greg Gabler, do you want to come up and address the council, please? feel like some of the debates right I got three minutes and 15 seconds and I got to do it in three minutes right there you go okay so I'll wait till after you say your name and address though yeah I'm gonna read it hello my name is Greg Gabler I've been a teacher and a football coach at St. Rain Valley School District for 25 years I have held a contractor's license in Fort Collins and Longmont for 39 years I worked as a teacher for nine months and as a contractor for at least for three months at least every year that I can remember. Without the second income, I don't know how I'd been able to do and live in Boulder County. Uh, after retiring from teaching, it was clear that my retirement by, from PER, though pretty good, would not be enough to give me a very uh, good retirement. I hadn't been able to accumulate any meaningful savings until I quit teaching and went into building full time. The savings, however, made little income supplement to my retirement as my interest for the whole year with the interest rates the way they were was $41. A realtor came to me and asked me if I wanted to build a sixplex. My answer was yes, but my thought of losing what little savings I had was daunting. I soon found out that I hadn't put enough money away to qualify to build the project. And so my son and daughter-in-law said they would be partners with me. With some intrepidation, I put a contract on the property with contingency to do my due diligence. I went to pre-app meetings. I visited the, the lady in the building department who did per permits and got an estimate for my permit. I did estimates for all of the buildings. Actually, you know what, Mr. Gell, I'm going I'm to let's stop. Let's fix this mic because we have time tonight and I want people to pay attention. I want to hear and it's distracting. No, you're not on the clock. I'll have you start over. Sorry. I, I mean, we're walking around the room and so could we could we fix the feedback? They're escaping. No, it's not you. It's been on all night. It's me. But test, nobody test, cares test, about test, hearing test. us, so. Test, 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 test. You still have a home over.
Test, 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 test. Test, test, test. Test, 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 test. <coughs> test, 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 test. Mayor, why don't you test? There you go. Test, Trent. test, test, test. Okay. Let's try this again. John, can you hear us? John Fryer. Thank you. All right, That's cool. Sorry, Mr. Gabler, why don't you go ahead and start over? We'll give you an extra minute and a half. You got it. No, go ahead. Go ahead and start from the beginning. Go ahead, please. Or anybody. That's all right. Nope, I'm you're okay. I'm going to say I've been a teacher and a football coach in the St. Vrain Valley School District for 25 years. I have held contractor license in Fort Collins in Longmont for 39 years. I worked as a teacher for nine months and worked as a contractor. For yeah, hold on, hold on. We're st we're still bad. Is it? I can I can talk loud. Yeah, this is a huge lot of I'm not on. There. there it is. Test, well, test, 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 <laughs> test. Right, you try now. Test, 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 test. 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 Oh, okay. No. You gotta unplug it, Sandy. Just set the other mic on the floor in case it's a proximity thing. Still hearing it though. Still doing it. Test, 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 test. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Test, 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 test. I'm not hearing a buzz. Cool. Good job, Lachlan. All right, let's go ahead. If you want to start again, we'll go for it. How could I change this? <laughs> Here we go. I've been a teacher and a coach at St. Vrain Valley for 25 years. I've held contractor's license in Fort Collins and Longmont for 39 years. I've worked as a teacher for nine months and as a contractor for three months every year. <coughs> to make it possible for me to live in this area. Without the second income, I don't know if I've been able to do so. After retiring from teaching, it was clear that the retirement provided by PERA though good, was not enough to have a meaningful retirement. I had been able to accumulate, hadn't been able to accumulate any meaningful savings until I quit teaching and went to building full time. The savings, however, made little income supplement for my retirement as my interest for a whole year with the interest rates they were was $41. A realtor came and asked me if I'd like to build a sixplex in town. My answer was yes, it's always yes. Uh, but my thoughts of losing my little savings was a little daunting. 
I soon found out that I hadn't put enough money away to qualify for the project, and so my son and daughter-in-law said they'd like to be partners with me. With some interpretation, I put a contract on the property with contingency to do my due diligence. I went to my pre-op meetings. I visited the lady in the permit department who gave me an estimate for my permit. Actually, she said it was better than an estimate. And I did all the estimates for all of the building. It was marginal, and I was leery, but my son encouraged me to go forward. We bought the lot, hired architects, engineers, and committed all of our cash to get going. We, assigned a pl we were assigned a planner to work with us, and we went forward full speed. We submitted our site plan and set goals to have our permit by January 1st. Along that time, my bank called me and said, did you know the city was considering an additional fee uh, called a, for affordable housing. They said that I'd have to come up with that money to handle any increases. I went to the mayor and I said, I can't do this. He assured me that my project was exempt for two reasons. It was too small and I would be grandfathered in. I went back to focusing on my plan review and architect plans. We got our site plans back after a first submittal with lots of notes to correct, but my planner said your plans are excellent. You clean up those red lines and we will be able to get this thing through very quickly. She even said you can submit for the building review of your bu building plans, it's that good. That's not usually done without some sort of uh, thing on the builder. Um, so I submitted my plans and pl paid a plan check fee for that of about $5,000. It was then that I was told my cost had doubled from what I was estimated from the building department. Another big blow to my finances. We still had our goal of starting January 1st, and I went often to see my planner to help push her through my approval. I'm a kind of pushy guy. After numerous visits, I found out that she was on an extended medical leave, and no substitute planner was assigned. During this time, council passed an ordinance and set two weeks or so to get plans approved. My focus changed from January 1st to panic. My planner came back and apologized for the circumstances her illness had caused. She said she would do something to get an approval before the 21st deadline. I don't know what it was. After two days, I saw her again, and she said she was told she couldn't do it by somebody above her. A few days later, I ran into another person in the lobby who I'd gotten to know very well. And by the way, I really like the people I learned and worked with within the city. Um, they were great. This guy to looked at me, and he said, Greg, we've had your plans entirely too long. I will hand deliver them and get approval Pre, and I'll predate them. Again, somebody up the line said, no way. I have finished the project and I have paid my, my uh, fee. I had to pay my fee to get renters to, to go into the building. But I've had to substitute money from landscaping, blinds, and interest that I need to carry the project till I get it fully rented. I'm in a financial problem, and it's not my fault. Thank you. All right. And I actually, yeah, I cheated because uh, we interrupted him plenty of times, so I gave him the full time. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to special reports and presentations. So we're in the study session. Um, are we going to move on? No, okay. Yeah, right. we don't then have let's do, any special. Let's start with the update on the climate change. Okay. I'm going to go right. Or do you want, actually, or do, what are you here for? Yes, this. All right. Okay, yes. then. Yes. I don't want you <laughs> to go away. I want you to. all I prepared for today yes, yes, anyway, yes. so. Yes, yes, All right. Uh, Mayor Bagley, members of council, I'm Lisa Knobloch, sustainability program manager, and I'm here tonight to give you an update on the climate action task force and climate action in general. 
And if I get too far away from the mic and you can't hear me, let me know, because I feel like you have to be really close to this thing. Or if I'm too close and it's making a weird sound, let me know. <laughs> let me know. OK, so Climate Action Task Force, you all saw a variation of this slide at the retreat a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Climate Action Task Force has now held five of their eight meetings. They have drafted uh, recommendations on the three topic areas on the left hand side and I will go through a pretty high level review of those recommendations with you tonight and they have now moved into developing recommendations for the education outreach adaptation resilience and land use and one change from when you saw the slide last is the they did decide to include waste management in the land use topic area so you'll see recommendations around that and in, included in land use when that comes through as I mentioned before, equity is incorporated throughout all of the recommendations, and there will be a section also on governance, plan evolution, and adaptation. So looking at what do we do once the report is completed. So I'm going to run through these pretty high level. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to holler. I'll do my best to answer. I, I'm not the drafter of these recommendations, and I only have summaries. So I'll do my best to, to get answers for you. I'll follow up if I don't have um, specific answers to your questions. So the Building Energy Use Group, their recommendations are focusing on uh, code updates. So we already have a policy in place where we adopt and implement the most recent uh, code updates every cycle. And this would be looking at including uh, things like solar and EV readiness in the next round of code updates coming in 2021. They're looking at a, an electrification recommendation. That group has decided that that's a pretty weighty and complicated topic, and they don't have enough time as they would like to really dive deep into the research that they need to to come up with a comprehensive uh, strategy around electrification. So their current draft recommendation is to form a feasibility committee to spend some extra time doing the research needed to really come up with a solid electrification strategy. Uh, focusing on commercial energy efficiency through things like uh, benchmarking and retro commissioning and then also residential energy efficiency through expanding and increasing participation in our efficiency works program and expanding the low income uh, energy efficiency program as well and then a cross-cutting recommendation that they're looking at is establishing a climate action fund and so that would be identifying a number of different revenue sources that would help uh, fund all of our climate action work because they recognize that in order to do a lot of the things that we're going to be proposing, we're going to need additional resources for uh, staffing and implementation. And they want to look further at uh, potential alternative revenue sources and establishing a fund to support that work. Uh, the Renewable Energy Group are looking at a number of complementary recommendations. Uh, starting with uh, smart grid, so that's really accel accelerating uh, the AMI installation and looking at a uh, developing a plan for how to use that uh, technology when it's only partially implemented, so not having to wait until it's fully completed. Uh, establishing a home energy management system, so a program to really uh, establish homes to optimize energy use and really set them up to manage uh, distributed energy resources as they come online. Uh, as establishing a five-year uh, plan for developing a major inventory of distributed energy resources uh, that are managed in Longmont, continuing to aggressively pursue internal and external policies for greenhouse gas reductions, and then workforce uh, development. So looking at how all of these things are going to be creating new workforce development opportunities uh, for Longmont and how we can set up programs to really help train people up for that, as well as understanding what are the sectors that might be negatively impacted as we move away from fossil fuels and making sure we have programs in place to retrain folks and get them into new sectors of work. Uh, the transportation group is looking at uh, greater access to and participation in transit, biking, walking, things that get people out of single occupancy vehicles looking at partnering with schools on multimodal options, looking at opportunities for incentivizing new programs for alternative modes of travel, uh, renewable sources to power transit, so that's not only electrification, but other alternative fuels as well, and then looking at employer-based programs like alternative work schedules to create more flexibility in the workplace to reduce the need for driving overall or to help create more flexible schedules to reduce congestion and things like that. 
So as I mentioned at the retreat, we're also going through a community engagement process concurrently to inform the public of the work that we're doing and to gain feedback on draft recommendations to understand how we might strengthen the recommendations, what are potential impacts or negative consequences that we might not be thinking about, and then what are we missing? And so where we're at in that process, we've developed and distributed flyers throughout town that are driving folks to the Engage Longmont website. We started tabling at a number of different community events. We're launching a questionnaire in the next couple of days. Uh, we'll be doing presentations with a number of different community groups, setting up educational kiosks at key community locations, and uh, working with volunteers to do what's called kitchen table conversations with friends, families, neighbors, coworkers, things like that and then bringing that information back to the Climate Action Task Force. So the next steps, again, they'll be drafting their recommendations for the new subgroups that we talked about. They have a joint meeting with the Just Transition Plan Committee on this Thursday the 5th, and that's a, a three and a half hour meeting where each of the subgroups that's completed recommendations to date will have an opportunity to go do a deep dive into one or two of the recommendations with the Just Transition Plan Committee who will do and essentially an equity analysis on those recommendations and talk through possible equity impacts and look at opportunities for uh, increasing the equitability of those recommendations. Again, they'll be able to incorporate all of that feedback and from the feedback from the community engagement efforts to refine and finalize their recommendations. The report is due April 8th and then the, um, that'll be presented to council on April 14th. And then in addition to what's happening with the Climate Action Task Force, uh, we wanted to mention that the city also is really taking a number of steps to accelerate uh, our work also in context of and in alignment with the climate emergency resolution and the resolution to transition to 100% renewable energy. So we've been working a lot with, with staff to identify what we're already doing and some additional strategies that we can take to help accelerate those efforts. I'm not going to go through every single one of these. I'm just going to pull out some highlights. But again, if you have questions on any of these, please feel free to holler. As I've mentioned, we're in the process of updating the greenhouse gas inventory. That's well underway. We have a lot of that data collected. And our consultants right now are in the process of modeling all of that information. And we'll bring those res uh, results back to you all when we have them in the next couple of months. Uh, we've talked to you about we're doing some energy efficiency assessments at a number of our city facilities. Uh, we've just recently uh, worked with the contractor on that to include an electrification component to that, so looking at opportunities for fully electrifying those f facilities uh, as well. We recently received a grant to transition some of our city land to low water turf and to do some demonstration and research uh, on opportunities around uh, not only reducing our water use on city property, but also utilizing plant materials that reduce the need for uh, mowing, which will reduce our uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with um, fuel use from um, those types of operations. And then as Dave Hornbacher has talked to you about, he's working with um, Platte River Power Authority on a distributed energy resource plan. And again, as I mentioned, that's a focus from the renewables energy group as well that will have the recommendations from the Climate Action Task Force around uh, distributed energy resources. So we've also identified a handful of quick wins, so things that we think would take uh, few to little resources and have um, little to no uh, negative impacts that we can put into place relatively quickly uh, to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So one of those things is telecommuting and web conferencing. That's something that the city already does, but there's not a lot of consistency across uh, departments around how people are utilizing that. There's not a lot of understanding across city staff about the technology that's available to folks. So that's looking at promoting that, creating greater educational opportunities so people know, know how to use the technology that we have available. Uh, looking at potentially replacing some of our fleet vehicles with e-bikes when possible. Uh, prohibiting plastic and disposable promotional giveaways. That's something that we do a lot across city events that we could look at um, changing our practices around that. Uh, it's shifting to a 10 hour work day or requiring telecommuting one day a week at facilities where that would be possible so we can actually shut down one of our facilities for a whole day and save all of the resources that are associated with that. And then prioritizing energy and water efficiency and low emissions practices and park development projects. So those are just a handful of things that we could put into place pretty quickly. 
And then new strategies, these are things that uh, we would need council direction on if, you, if these are things that you would like us to pursue and would also probably likely uh, need additional time and resources to really dive into these and, and get the details on them. Uh, what one of the things would be looking at um, a incorporating a climate change se section or topic into all of our city plans, so making sure that we're addressing climate change comprehensively across um, the organization, requiring LEED or other green building standards in all new buildings or major renovations, looking at renewable energy opportunities and Nelson Flanders and Button Rock, and then looking at something like a universal recycling ordinance. And I know Bob and Charlie are coming to you guys in a couple of weeks to really go much more in depth into some of those opportunities around waste diversion and reduction. A couple of things I just wanted to make sure are on your radar, if they're not already, some upcoming events that are tied to climate action work. Tomorrow is the Platte River Power Authority Community Focus Group, where they'll be talking about some of the findings coming out of their integrated resource plan. So if you're not aware that that's happening, it's tomorrow from 6 to 8 p.m. at the 17th Place Event Center. And then also tomorrow is the Linking Longmont, which, which is a transportation-oriented event at the museum from 5 to 7 p.m. So just to have some things on your radar. Oh, that didn't come out well. Sorry for the, <laughs> the color on that. I didn't realize it changed with the, the web link there. But I just want to make sure everybody always knows that um, for more information or for information on how, on how people get, can get involved with sustainability work and climate action work, they can always go to the sustainability page. We have all of our previous quarterly reports on there. We have all the information about the Climate Action Task Force as well as our contact information. So. That's where we're at. Does anyone have any questions or comments they'd like to share? Councilor yes. Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you go back one slide uh, before that? Um, uh, some of these I'm a little confused about. Are these for city actions, internal city actions only? There are, there are things that we, that staff can take on internally, yes. Okay, because the like uh, co uh, require lead or other green building standards in new buildings and major res. Uh, I think that's going to come out of the buildings as a, a general requirement for the next code update. Is that correct? Not specifically that I've heard. And again, this is, this is coming from recommendations from staff that we've asked to identify potential strategies that they could put into place as well. Um, did you want to add something, yeah, Harold? So Am I on? So I think there are some of the recommendations that will come into the code conversation that Lisa touched on that will be in the future. What we're saying here is in terms of how we look at our construction projects that are ahead of that conversation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we will look at them under this lens. So this is really something we can do ahead of that. Okay. Yes, thank you for that clarification. Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, the what you have listed as recommendations are kind of categories in which recommendations have been or are being developed yeah yeah they're I mean high level yes so <clears throat> you we did you didn't share them with us tonight is that because or in preparation for this is that because they're just not ready they're too drafty they're pretty drafty and I just got them on Thursday so in, yeah, in the okay. again yeah, we talked through them Thursday at the climate action task force meeting and they now have some time to go in and tighten up their recommendations according to the templates I get that, that it's, I a tough, it's a tight timeline but mm -hmm. here's the one thing I would ask you to think about uh -huh. as I look at the timeline and the public engagement process and when you're coming back to us which all is driven by the t initial timeline and the budgeting process so if we're going to do something with a climate fund it needs to be in front of us before we mm -hmm. make budget decisions but the one concern I have Lisa, is um, there's a ton of work, all of it's good, I'm sure, big, powerful ideas. I'm going to feel a little squeezed if we're the last ones to see recommendations after they've been processed by the community and you get the community engagement process and they're, you know, they're kind of rolled up into, okay, what do we do at that point in time other than say, bless them, right? If you want meaningful, if we get a chance to have a meaningful part in this. It's um, going to go to you, for, it's going to go to the council. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah. It's going to go to the council first, 
and then yes. we will then off of the council conversation then go through those other community okay. involvement I, I was, processes. I, maybe I saw, well, should have seen that and just didn't. Yeah, so to clarify, we are going through a community engagement process in, in the month of March to get That's feedback. That's what it sounded like. Yeah, so, and the draft recommendations are more of these category. They're not, the, they're not super in depth. It's just to try to get a sense of one, we're trying to bring the community along with yeah, us I, in I this conversation as much as possible just and to try to get a sense of are there negative thing, consequences that we might not have on our Just radar. a heads up. I, it looks yeah. like we could get squeezed on it. I'm just saying. No, and it, it's partly to help inform the Climate Action Task Force as they finalize right. their recommendations before they come to Not you. a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose it's a question for Harold, maybe Joni. And, and at the risk of beating a dead horse, I'm going to beat it some more. Uh, on slide four of 12, uh, tell me which of those I could consider as an extraordinary benefit and expect to see proposed if we were to allow developers to deliver to us extraordinary benefits in the context of a metro district, which of those might I be able to expect to see in an application? Probably the distributed energy resources. Yeah. Um, that's the most. How about carbon free neighborhoods? Wouldn't that be the next to the last bullet? Control yep. of greenhouse em 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 Correct. emissions? What about smart grids? I mean, what's on that list other than workforce development that wouldn't be a legitimate, extraordinary benefit presented to us as an option if, if we thought it was a high enough priority. We're talking about a climate crisis and we've taken off the board, off the table as a council, the opportunity to include those extraordinary benefits in new development in this community. That's not your problem to solve or to address. But I, I just want to say it just makes no sense to me on the one hand to, to claim crisis and on the other hand be unwilling to get smart enough, to learn enough, to figure out how to take advantage of those opportunities as new housing stock comes on into the community. Thank you. To, to an, I also want to get a different point. You all will be the first to see the specific recommendations and information. The specific information is coming to council first. Yeah. Well, my comment wasn't directed at anybody on the staff. You understand yeah. that? No, no, not this. It was the directed at my question. colleagues up here. Yeah. Previous question is the one I was referring to. All right, anybody else? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, let's move on to item 4B, potential ballot item for debt financing of water projects. The illustrious Dale, your automaker, the one, the only. Mayor Bagley, members of council, I'm Dale Rademacher, uh, Deputy City Manager, and uh, here tonight to uh, talk with you really uh, fairly briefly on a particular issue that we have talked with you in the past about, and that is on the financing strategies that uh, we believe are necessary for the city to realize um, uh, the resources necessary to maintain the city's um, treated water and water delivery systems to our community. Um, many of you were on council uh, when we did the uh, integrated treated water master plan several years ago. That document identified upwards of $200 million of, of resources that are going to be needed to both expand and but primarily maintain this system uh, that the community has come to rely on for the delivery of water. Uh, inherent in that uh, overall plan and also embedded in the uh, rates that you approved last fall uh, was continued debt financing as one of those uh, options uh, to, to get to that point. Um, and uh, Jim Engstead is going to talk with you a little bit about some of the projects that we are uh, believing are necessary and sort of qualify for that type of a financing strategy. Um, and, and also the uh, um, the intergenerational benefit that, that is derived uh, through a debt, surfing, uh, a, a debt servicing approach. In other words, current people pay it as well as future uh, um, residents that come into our community. And so it really does try to balance out that, that obligation uh, a, 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 in addition to it being a very uh, flexible 
uh, tool for us to use and balance the cash financing alternatives uh, with the debt financing mode. And um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Uh, really what we're looking for tonight is um, uh, we believe in order to stay on track, in particular with the Nelson Flanders treatment plant expansion, uh, it is um, um, really necessary that we would seek uh, voter approval this fall at the 2020 um, uh, general election uh, to issue additional water bonds for that particular project. You're not, we're not asking for a formal vote tonight to place it on the ballot, but rather whether you want us to continue to pursue uh, the effort and do the necessary work such that we would bring that to you uh, for your consideration this summer. With that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Good evening, Mayor Bagley, City Council members, Jim Angstadt, Director of uh, Engineering Services with the Public Works and Natural Resources Department. I'm going to go ahead and just make a note here and cross off my first item because Dale already pretty much covered it. So we'll go to the second slide. Um, in 2013, the city completed the uh, integrated treated water supply master plan, which identified the capital needs for the city's water utility for the next 20 years. Uh, in order for the city to continue to provide safe and reliable drinking water to our residents and our customers. Uh, the plan identified the cost for these, uh, for our, uh, basically our capital needs at over $200 million. Um, to date, staff has been working on some of the critical short-term projects, but we are now at a point where we are ready to advance the debt financing component of the financial plan that supports the larger capital projects. So the first one project we want to just quickly throw your way is, as Dale had mentioned, the water treatment plant expansion at Nelson Flanders. Uh, the city has two water plants um, which provide our treated water to our residents, uh, Nelson Flanders plant and the Wade Gaddis plant. The um, Wade Gaddis is the older of the two. Um, it was designed with an older filtering process and it can be challenging for our operators to provide water that meets current drinking water standards. An expansion of the Nelson Flanders plant will provide the capacity um, once we, or after we, or, and then as part of that project, we would also decommission Wade Gaddis. Another pen potential project is the North St. Vrain pipeline. Um, this is located north of Lyons. The pipeline carries raw water uh, from this North St. Vrain Crete to the Nelson Flanders water treatment plant. <coughs> pipeline was constructed in the 40s and 50s. Um, and as you can see, one of the challenges is there are access issues. The photo on the right um, shows that the, uh, the, the pipeline, because of its age, has been deteriorating. Um, and it, uh, it is, uh, makes it an ideal candidate for replacement. So the other, another alternative project we can, we're looking at is the Price Park Reservoir. The original reservoir was constructed in 1923. We had improvements undertaken in the 70s and 90s. Um, this is located over by the Sunset Golf Course. Um, the facility is reaching the end of its useful life. Um, it is displaying some leakage from the liner. Um, there are some openings in the roof that are requiring extensive maintenance and state inspections have called for a higher degree of maintenance um, to meet current standards. So that's just some of the quick, quick highlights of some of our projects. We are looking for council direction. Um, but as you, and as Dale indicated, as you're aware, debt financing of projects is subject to voter approval. Um, and in the past, residents of Longmont have been highly supportive of the city's um, effort to improve our public utility infrastructure. Uh, other examples of that are the, um, we did bonds for the wastewater system as well as the storm drainage system. So this evening, Public Works and Natural Resources is requesting city council direction on moving forward for us to uh, continue our efforts to prepare for a possible placement of this issue on the ballot for the November 2020 general election. Council Mayor Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Mr. Angstead, um, is, is this uh, already secured bonds or, or is there a tax associated with the bond issue to secure? 
I'm going to have some of our wonderful staff come up and answer that question. <laughs> Uh, uh, Council Member uh, Martin, the um, the bonds would be paid for by water rates. There's no taxes involved. Okay. It, and it would be secured by the rates and the rate increases that you have already codified. Uh, so there's we don't need to go back and do yet another adjustment um, to the rate uh, fee strategy that you put in place, which is a five-year plan of rate adjustments. Yes. Okay. So. So that means that we are asking for bond authority and we're not asking for any more money from the rate payers or the taxpayers that other than what has is already in the plan. Correct. Uh, other than what you have already codified. Um, but to be clear, the rates are uh, increasing. Um, they are scheduled to increase each of the next several years. And so you know, uh, the way I would say is that we have already laid out the uh, rate structure necessary to fund uh, the mm -hmm. capital improvements necessary for the next several years without having to increase the rates even further than what you have already approved. Does that Agreed. make sense? Yes, I just wanted to make sure that that was out there. Um, if I could make a statement while I have my mice, mic working, um, I would like to say that I think it is important uh, in the face of what we're looking at evaluating in terms of the climate action task force recommendations that our ongoing planned infrastructure updates happen on schedule before some of these major activities that were unanticipated hit us. So I, I really, I'm in favor of proceeding with this if it's at all possible. All right, see nobody else. I've got the only question. I'm so I'm going to make a motion when I uh, uh, ask this question. So we've had ballot. So this is on a scale from one to ten. This is like a ten, right? As far I mean, we need to fix our water's infrastructure. I want to make sure that we don't have the same mistake. We mean we didn't need a swimming pool and ice rink, right? But we've learned some lessons, which was moving forward with a ballot initiative or a ballot measure without having buy-in from the community, specifically certain members of the community. I mean, I'm going to make a motion that we move forward, but I think it would be foolish if we just put it on the ballot. I think we need to hold community meetings. I think we need to pay to, you know, market as to what the needs are and why we're doing this. We need to market to make sure that people understand that we're not going to be additionally increasing rates, that we will not be asking for a tax because it will get muddy and people will start complaining that we didn't take it to the public and we didn't, you know, I mean, and, and even if we do, they're still gonna complain about it. So we have to go like over the top, no surveys, no, I mean like meetings in your face, call Gordon, call the people who, I mean, call them and just say, hey, please attend the meeting because we're gonna need your support or else they're gonna kill it. Uh, Mayor Bagley, if I could respond to that real quickly. Uh, that's exactly why we're here in, in uh, the first part of March, because I agree with you. I believe we need to communicate and, and, and talk with our uh, community about the, the very need. This is, in my estimation, not a want to have. This is a need to have. If you value having clean, reliable water uh, for your community. So I put it in that category, but right. I might be a bit biased coming from Public right. Works, and I'll admit that. And so, yes, our intent is to work very closely with Marika and the entire uh, city public information team to um, really have a, a, a good community dialogue around this, such that when we bring this to you uh, later this summer uh, for your, you know, your formal consideration of it, you will have um, that information as well. Okay. Then I, with that, I'd move that we, uh, I move that we instruct staff to move forward with efforts to, for possible placement on the ballot for the 2020 election. Second. All right, seeing uh, Dr. Waters. So is that what is that what we're doing tonight? I, I thought you were going to bring it back. For, it's, just for we'll just move action. forward. The motion is to move forward to prepare for a potential ballot issue right, and for okay. you to make that decision. And I believe it's the August time frame. Yeah, very August good. is when you will be voting to formally place it on very the ballot good. or not. Can I make one editorial comment? At the latest. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, you can do it. So. Uh, I, I mentioned, I think, last Tuesday night this news article or news uh, television news piece we'd seen just before I left to come to the meeting about 
a water main. I think it was in St. Petersburg, Florida. It may have been Fort Lauderdale. But sewer I mean, main. it was it was catastrophic. Sewer. Pardon me? Sewer main. It was a sewer main, yeah. <laughs> but it was a catastrophic failure. And um, what we're trying to do is avoid that, That's, uh, right, those kinds of experiences. So to the degree that in building the case that the mayor's talking about, uh, we could build a portfolio of examples of where people have failed to do this because they continue to defer and defer and defer. Carol's got several. <laughs> in, in, all, in all honesty, um, I've lived through it. On the backside of shortly after um, I obtained the position I was in the previous community, we lost water to about 75% of the community. We also had a major sewage leak that spilled thousands of gallons of raw sewage into the river um, and had to very quickly completely restructure the capital improvement plan to try to get ahead of that cycle. Um, and if you don't plan and you don't look out 20 to 30 years, you will create a significant financial need. Not if, but when. It, 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 right, it's not if, but when. And so my experience and what I've always said is I never want anyone to be in that same position in the future. And so we have to be very focused in terms of how we're managing the system and how we're looking into the future. I'm just talking I don't about want to go through that. Again. Let's not so I can give you personal <laughs> examples of that. I, I did want to end with one thing before you vote on that. We had a paragraph in the communication about the street fund. I know there was some council interest on whether we should or shouldn't move forward as well uh, to potentially consider some sort of a debt servicing uh, package on the street fund. We are working on that. We're not ready to bring that uh, to you for discussion yet. Uh, I, I would think in the next 30 to 60 days we'll have that discussion, just so you know that. And part of that conversation is when we get information like we received last week about a $4 million grant that starts changing how we're evaluating the financial considerations. And, and there's another grant that we're going to be going for, and I think that's due mid, the answer will be midsummer. Is that what we heard? Yes. And so there are things that we need to also wait on to really understand what that need is. All right. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor. All in favor say aye. the motion is to direct staff to move forward on the preparations to put this on the 2020 ballot. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right. The motion passes unanimously with Councilmember Peck absent. All right. Let's move on to four. We doing okay? It's eight o'clock. We've been going for a little over an hour. We're all right. Keep right. Going. All right. Four C healthy beverages for children's meals. Mayor, members of City Council, my name is Karen Roney. I'm the Community Services Director. And as you recall, uh, earlier this year, there was some discussion among City Council about uh, healthy beverages with children meals, and the Council provided some direction to staff to, um, to bring back for discussion at a study session a uh, possibility of bringing forward uh, an ordinance. So tonight, this is that discussion. It, we have nine slides. We have three or four people who are going to be making the, the presentation. Um, and I will, um, I will wrap that up with uh, some questions that you might have and, and really to get some direction from council about if you want to pursue us um, doing more work and bringing back an, an ordinance about healthy beverages with children meals. So I want to introduce Olga Bermudez, who is with Children, Youth, and Families, and she will uh, go over the first uh, three slides with you. Good evening, uh, Mayor Bagley and City Council members. I'm Olga Bermudez with Children, Youth, and Families. So I want to talk today a little bit about the process. So, um, you know, there has been like a long process, I want to say three years, working with the community. So uh, the Healthy in Longmont is a coalition uh, between that was uh, conformed between parents. Um, it was also community members, uh, children, youth, and families, local businesses, public health, the state, and national health uh, organizations that came together really just to look and to see how we're going to be able to support uh, our children. How we're we going to make sure that our children are really healthy. So 
this uh, this coalition um, started working at uh, you know bringing the messages into our community. So through uh, different uh, community events, you know, like uh, Cinco de Mayo, especially targeting the Latino uh, community. Also, uh, the Colorado Latino Festival and uh, unity in the community. So this coalition was going to different uh, events, just bringing the information, bringing some uh, educational tools so people were really aware of uh, their consumption. So, you know, through uh, really uh, dynamic uh, exercises, so engaging the, uh, the community, asking questions, and through games. So parents and kids were learning really about the amount of sugar they were consuming and we were really amazed to see that uh, a lot of parents were not really aware of this that they wasn't they were not really thinking that you know a kid in a glass of water and ounces sometimes they can consume between eight to ten uh, spoons uh, of sugar in one uh, drink so uh, through this process a lot of uh, articles were published in the Times call and then also in our uh, local magazine and some uh, letters uh, to the editor also were uh, published and uh, multiple presentations were done at the schools, uh, middle school, elementary school, and high school. Uh, also presentations at uh, children, youth, and families, um, presentations at uh, Salud uh, Clinic. Also, they collaborate uh, with this uh, effort. And also, the Hidden uh, Sugar Campaign was uh, promoted at Clinica, Longmore United Hospital, and through uh, other uh, organizations. So this message was just uh, in, into the community through these uh, three years. And also through the Mayor's Book Club, uh, it, we always send an insert. So we send that uh, the information about the impact of the sugary drinks you know, to families. So we send this twice, so that was able to reach like 1,325 uh, families um, that we were able to, to work with. And um, MS messages were sent also through Facebook, uh, Twitter, and uh, uh, so social media. And also a reach was done through the summer meals programs. We have a meal program uh, for the last uh, three years. So this group have been going to the meals programs and educating again parents and children about the impact of the sugary drinks. And also uh, the farmers uh, market also was uh, an outreach done. Here in this slide, you can see all the different organizations that have been uh, pledging and supporting uh, this effort. So if you see this slide, you can see uh, Salud uh, Clinic, you can see uh, our local uh, nonprofits, and also you can see uh, business, uh, the Roots and the Jefes is also one of the business that have been really uh, supportive. And actually, tonight we have um, Sean, that is a business owner. So we reach out uh, to them, and uh, also we have that uh, support. Also, you can see the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association. So uh, this group hasn't been working just alone. So it, this is a coalition really trying to tackle this issue from so many uh, different perspectives. And uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the, the ordinance. So the ordinance uh, is not a really punitive ordinance. Pretty much what we are trying to accomplish here is uh, the restaurants will be uh, offering, uh, you know, when they have the children's meal, they're going to be offering a healthy uh, beverage. And a healthy beverage, the definition will be uh, water uh, with no other natural or artificial sweetness, milk with no dairy uh, substitutes, with no added natural or artificial sweetness. So pretty much will be water. Uh, sparkling uh, water or milk without any uh, sugar. And the restaurants is still, they can sell another uh, type of beverages. If parents request that or the children request that, they can uh, also, um, they will be able to provide that beverage. So now I would like to uh, introduce uh, Tessa from uh, Public Health. So it's gonna uh, keep uh, providing more information about uh, the work that Public Health have been doing. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and City Council. So I know you all have heard a lot about this and I'll keep it brief, but we just wanted to be really clear on what the policy says. So our definition of a children's meal is a meal that is advertised to children that comes with food and a beverage for one price. The default beverage is the beverage that automatically is offered with the meal. So those are the definitions of what we're talking about. And I included the definition of default here just because I think as we're talking about choice and that comes, a lot, uh, comes up a lot in this conversation, the definition of default is a choice automatically made by somebody else. So as we're thinking about this, what we're doing is really opening choices up for parents is, is how we see this. So this is just a depiction of what could be offered as Olga explained that there's unflavored milk or any kind of water without added sugars. And we know that this works. 
Disney Resorts adopted this over 10 years ago, and you can see from the chart here that 68% of the time, parents stick with a default healthy beverage option. McDonald's also did this, and this data is from 2014, 2015, and they uh, just released some new numbers in 2018, and the number of healthy beverage um, choices has increased another 10%, so it's almost up to, I think it's at 55% now. So we know that this works. So Disney does it? Disney does it. Okay. McDonald's does it. That's a, that, that's a quote from Mayor Bagley in the paper. <laughs> Disney does it? Yes, <laughs> Disney does it. Uh, so here is, just so you can have you know, a real sense of the impact on local restaurants. When we're talking about restaurants here, we're talking about, um, we're not talking about food trucks or grocery stores or convenience stores. We're talking about places that serve meals. They could be um, sit down restaurants, they could be fast food restaurants. There are a total of 218, um, according to Public Health, the way we classify these things in Longmont. Right now, 80 are serving children's meals, or I'm sorry, so it's 37% serving children's meals. 92% of those are currently offering sugary drinks. So there are 74 restaurants that would be impacted by this policy. And, um, and at this point, uh, Sean Gaffner, who owns Smoke and Bowls, The Roost, and Hafez, who's been an amazing member of the Healthy Longmont Coalition and has voluntarily adopted this himself, is here to talk about the business perspective. Hey, y'all. Thanks for having me. Um, not that you have a choice. I think I get to just show up and talk, so I may do this more often. <laughs> Tuesday nights, huh? Um, ten years ago, I heard it said that uh, restaurants are the heart of this uh, are the heart of a city, and um, that's all. Always since then, kind of been part of the grid through which I, I filter uh, decisions to just responsibly run restaurants. Um, it's actually been printed on our menus the last five years, and um, it's it's why we chose from the very beginning to give 10% of all of our profits back towards, uh, just back to the community. Um, we've given over $120,000 to help uh, local families um, in the process of adoption. Uh, we've helped eight kids come home that wouldn't have, maybe wouldn't have been able to. Uh, without that, it's why I've always uh, kind of done the extra work to, to responsibly source uh, local and sustainable products that we sell. Um, a few years ago when we started seeing all the statistics about single-use plastic, um, I personally spent uh, quite a bit of time and, uh, and resources towards, uh, to figure out how to eliminate those from our restaurants, and it's been about two and a half years with all three restaurants now, uh, no single-use plastic there, um, still pressuring the companies we order from to stop packaging things in, in bags. But, um, and so it was really clear when about a year ago, I started seeing the statistics about uh, sugary beverages and the effects on kids' health. Um, and so we look at, okay, well, how, how can we be more responsible with what we do inside the restaurants? Um, and for us, and we even, when we changed the menu about a year ago to where it used to say, uh, you know, kids' meal includes I think, it, I, I think it listed so like sodas, lemonade, juice, water, or milk. So we changed it to just say uh, includes water or milk. Um, and, and that for us and, and what we communicate to our staff, spe uh, specifically our servers, is that this isn't us uh, you know, ever wanting to like shame parents if they ask for a soda or even um, tell them how to parent, but really uh, rather it's us partnering with parents. I've, I have four kids myself, and so I know what it's like uh, when you go to a restaurant and said it includes a soda. Uh, some of them even have like includes dessert or pictures of milkshakes, or that's a fight every single time, even with the best kids that know it's not going to come. Um, and so for us, it feels more like partnering with parents to um, like not have that fight, especially, you know, maybe 20 years ago when it was uh, a lot more rare and more of a special occasion to go out to dinner. Uh, you know, it was probably way more common and fairly harmless to let your kid have a soda because it's special. Uh, but now it's, I mean, I see the same families in, especially between multiple restaurants, five to 10 meals a week families are going out now. And so for us, this just feels like, uh, how can we be responsible with these families that are eating out five to 10 times a week or five to 10 meals a week um, and right now? And uh, yeah, I, 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 our, 
every once in a while we have parents that ask, hey, can we substitute a lemonade or a soda for the milk? And my staff know our number one core value is that we're a yes restaurant. And so it's always a resounding yes, absolutely. Free refills, sure, like extra spoonfuls of sugar. Like you're the parents, you can parent them. But for us, it really feels like just trying to be helpful. And, and Free refills on chicken wings? No, just kidding. Maybe for you guys. Um, I'll test that theory. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's... that. I don't know if you guys have any questions. I know um, some people have asked about like, what about the costs? Because soda is really inexpensive. Um, but what we've found is since it said just water and milk, like 70% of the times they just say water. Um, and so I, I think if anything, we're spending a little bit less money on beverage costs for kids uh, because I, I, with my family, with my kids, we always just get water and they know that now. Um, but anyway. That I, so it's not that now instead of spending a, a nickel on a soda, we're spending 25 cents on a glass of milk. It's we're serving 70% water. All right. Great. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. I, Carrie? So just a, just a couple more slides, and then, uh, then we'll act, turn it over. So, so um, as uh, Olga had mentioned initially, the, um, the coalition here in Longmont, Boulder County Public Health, they have done a tremendous job of doing outreach and education for the past three years. And one of the things that if council would like us to continue on um, this discovery and finding out you know, what the community's appetite is for, for this particular ordinance, that we, would, um, that we would do some additional community engagement. We would um, primarily work with our um, engaged Longmont process Obviously, restaurant owners are very busy. They have a lot going on. They don't have a lot of time to go to meetings. And so what we would do is that we have done some preliminary work with our um, communications and marketing staff around how to set up an engaged Longmont site with um, stories, questions, and answers, community forums to, to make it easy for, um, for restaurant owners to be able to weigh in. Because as, as you saw that, you know, there are 70 some restaurants that would be directly impacted by this ordinance if we choose to move forward with that. So we need their voice, we want their input um, in order to this to be successful if council chooses to move forward. So we will have a, a kind of a, a restaurant site and as well as a, a community site because lots of people have opinions about this. And, um, and so we also will indicate how Boulder County Public Health has resources and abilities to support uh, restaurants to come into compliance uh, with this ordinance if, again, if we choose um, to move forward with that. And certainly, based on the input that we get from um, from the, the community, if there are some modifications to the ordinance, uh, we would certainly um, include those for further consideration with, um, with City Council. So really tonight, we're looking for some direction and uh, from Council, some, some input. Um, in particularly around the uh, compliance issue too is that um and eugene may our city attorney can uh, help me with this but what we would what we would look at or what we propose would be is that boulder county public health would be responsible for um you know for compliance they already um are responsible for inspecting restaurants certifying restaurants or healthy, doing things right, um, not making people sick. So, um, so they're already out there engaging with restaurants and they could really be the, um, be the party responsible for uh, compliance. And if there was a violation, then they would in turn contact the, um, the city of Longmont. We would designate the staff to be their contact. Um, and then we would go through the, uh, the, the process of um, I enforcement, if you will. And so, um, so we, we would need some direction from, from council about uh, what kind of an enforcement option we would look at. So I understand, and Eugene can help me. So I understand that, um, that certainly by the, the charter requires us that if we have an ordinance, then we're responsible for enforcing it. Um, and so, so, but we also have uh, an administrative civil penalty um, in within our code that um, allows us to, to, um, to, to basically enforce and uh, violations to deal with violations through an administrative or a civil uh, penalty option uh, rather than a criminal one. And so, you know, so we would be looking for any direction from council in regard to um, in regard to client compliance and enforcement, as well as anything else that we had in the the very drafty ordinance that we included in the in the packet. So, questions, direction, anything that you would want to direct staff to either move forward in this way. Stop I, anything in between. Uh, Councilmember Christensen. Um, 
I do think that this is a very good idea. I think that all government is a, is a balance between the individual's rights and the community's, the community's rights. And in this case, um, I think this is a modest uh, compromise that allows people to have their choice. It's just that the default drink that comes is either so is either water or uh, milk, and I think that is that is the thing that uh, people most misunderstand about this. We're not telling them as parents what to do. We're just saying that when you order a meal, the default choice will be one of those two choices. You can still order whatever you want. As somebody who's dragged around a car full of little boys, tanked up on candy and caffeinated sugary beverages, I can tell you it would have been nice to have a choice of not giving them that, but you know. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, I do think that the, the two sites are good. I think the two things that uh, need to be clarified for a business probably is that if I serve somebody a drink that they ask for, will I be fined? And the answer is no, because they asked for that and the default beverages that you're bringing are those default beverages. And I think the thing that needs to be clarified for parents is you're ordering me around and you're telling me what to do with my kids and blah, 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 blah. And no, we're actually not. We're giving you the choice of, you know, you have a choice of milk or water. If you want other choices, then you can order them and we'll bring them. But I think this makes it very, um, very simple. The The level of of childhood um, uh, decay, uh, tooth decay, and obesity, and diabetes, which all have t really awful long-term consequences, is a habit that gets set up in childhood often. Or it's a matter of genetics, but it's exacerbated by mm -hmm. sugary drinks. And um, you know, I think this makes it easier for a lot of parents to just say, "No, you're going to." This is, these are your choices. Um, I also, um, um, now I've forgotten what I was gonna say. Um, anyway, I, I, I also wanted to thank um, Sean because he is one of the more successful businessmen in town and he's also a good guy. And he did this voluntarily because he sees the sense in this. And I would really much prefer to have had many more business do th businesses do this. It's much better if people voluntarily do stuff. But as we all know, people often don't make that choice. And so uh, this to me seems like a very sensible thing. I'm not interested really in a civil penalty. penalty. I think these are pretty modest uh, amounts because it's the first one is just $35. The second was it was in five years. <laughs> So that gives people a lot of time. Oh, I remembered what I wanted to say. Is there a time for a business to phase this in? I mean, I, I don't want to phase it in like, next week, <laughs> you have to do this, because they have Menus. They s may have yeah. to reprint menus. That's very expensive. C correct. I think um, I think the yeah. Tessa Hale has uh, from Boulder County Public Health has, has indicated that the health department does have resources. They want to help. Um, okay. Okay. Restaurants come into compliance, so if they need assistance in um, costs with reprinting menus, that kind of thing, that um, that they would do that, and then yeah. they also would would recommend a, um, a a delay or if the if we do move forward the ordinance and it passes to have enough time to be able to transition and help people be successful yeah. with that. There's and always whiteout, but that's not too classy. Th <laughs> there, there, there is whiteout. So, yeah. uh, and and I think in terms of just to, to clarify that the compliance is really about um, do you if you serve a, a children's meal, which mm -hmm. defined as it's a one price for a, yeah. a beverage and a meal, um, that you have that correctly listed on your menu. That is yeah. really what, when public health goes in to do the reinspections, that's what they would be looking for. If you offer that children's meal, does it have a healthy yeah. beverage? That's the level of, of compliance that they would be looking for. Yeah, and I hope that would be a very modest cost to businesses so to make that change. Anyway, thank you for bringing it forth. Uh, 
I, 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 Councilmember Martin. Are you done? I'm yeah. sorry. Well, I could move, or I don't know if you want to move it. You gonna move it? I move that we um, adopt this. Do we direct we, staff we, to move forward? Yes, right. move staff to move forward. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. Second. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Christensen and seconded by Dr. Waters. Councilmember Martin. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to vote to move forward, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to say because I think some of this was stated in complicated ways. The only thing a restaurant would be out of compliance for is what it says on the menu and not what they serve or anything else. Mm -hmm. It's just what it says on the menu. Cor correct. And yes, correct. Um, and then. Uh, the other th question that I wanted to ask, and, and Councilmember uh, Christensen came close to it, is is uh, chain restaurants especially have menu um. reprint cycles, um, and I would like to make sure that the ordinance takes that into account in terms mm -hmm. of the com interval required for compliance. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's all. I agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Councilman Reed Lagle Ferry, well, you know, don't apologize. You're on council. You're, <laughs> so, this is what we do. Go ahead. It's so, your turn. Yeah, I know it's been a, it's been a long time, but um, so something I did want to point out that I thought was very just an astounding bit of facts is that in the United States, the health um, costs due to obesity-related diseases are approximately 190 billion dollars, yeah. with rough, about 40 percent of that being paid through Medicare and Medicaid, which our taxpayer, you know, we pay for those programs. So, you know, if my calculations were correct, that's approximately $76 billion that is being spent on obesity-related um, diseases, illnesses. So I just, I, I, do, I am gonna move forward with this, but, you know, so some of the pushback that I've heard from constituents was that, you know, well, it, we're government, these are choices, people still have choices, but us as a governmental institution, we are promoting and standing behind healthy drink options for healthier lifestyle, so yes. Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, I'm also gonna support this because I think it's the right thing to do. And the data that uh, Council Member Hidalgo Faring just shared is part of the reason. And, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, we've all read the emails of, about uh, becoming a nanny state and whatnot. Um, but to say, I, I wonder if those who uh, would, would accuse us of parenting uh, would choose not to put their children in car seats, which, is a, which government says you do because we owe it to children for their safety. Uh, or that we would say, hey, use a seatbelt or not, isn't the law that the state says you're going to use a seatbelt because of the cost to society if you don't? So it seems to me that we're falling far short of that kind of role for the state. But so we're sending a clear signal about our values and how important it is to pay attention uh, as decision and, and, and as the as we heard to make it easy for parents to make the right decision on behalf of their children. And I think it is absolutely what we ought to be doing. All right, there's a motion on the table. Uh, actually, I just wanna say that I'm gonna vote for it. Um, however, when it comes back, if it's, I will make a motion not to include an administrative penalty if it comes back with one. Um, I will also make a motion that we give plenty of time in order to allow them to hit their reprint cycle. Because, uh, I, 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 uh, I don't look at this as us being in any state either. I think it's just a matter of just letting people know that, hey, water and milk come with it. And if they take the proactive step to say, hey, but we want some sugary drinks or pop or whatever, you can still do that. It's not that big of a deal. My, my bigger concern isn't telling parents what to do with their kids, because we're not. We're telling the restaurants how to run their business and the really the, 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 the only thing that uh, I think that a business owner would be concerned with is why are you imposing costs on me? Um, so I just want to make sure that we're not imposing those costs, even if it makes, even if it means that we have to go a little bit longer in allowing them to become compliant. So, all right, we have a motion on the table. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. 
All right, that passes unanimously with those of us present, and Councilmember Peck is not present, and so she'll be back tomorrow. Thank All right, thank so you. thank you. All right, last but not least, uh, let's talk about House Bill 20 1164 concerning the exemption of a housing authority from certain fees imposed by a water conservancy district. I assume everybody has read this. If not, take two seconds while I make a motion. I move that we direct staff to oppose House Bill 20 1164. Second. second. Yeah, we all seconded. All right, so that was moved by me and seconded by everyone. We'll say, we'll say Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Get him on the get him on the agenda for tonight. All right, and then uh, anybody have any further comments, debate, etc.? All right, uh, Councilmember Martin. Yeah, thank you. I just I just wanted to say, you know, from the water board, that they were pretty serious about opposing this, and they had very good reasons. So I won't go into them at length, but trust us, it's not a good plan. All right. So that said, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, that passes unanimously with Councilmember Peck absent. Mayor Bagley, so, one other yeah. really fast thing. At Coffee with Council, there was a question about the status of the um, management of single-use plastic. So I just thought I'd give a very fast update as to where that is. The City Council, you may remember that uh, you supported House Bill 1163 really in your first session. At this point, it's still in committee. So it's still turning and burning, and so I haven't heard necessarily anything. I know they've had a lot of debate about it, how to phase it in and what it's going to look like, but that bill is still alive. Uh, and that's where it stands. So, thank you. All right. Uh, all right. That said, let's move on to mayor and council comments. Councilmember Martin. I just wanted to uh, uh, add to what Assistant City Manager Sater said, uh, which is that the uh, Climate Emergency Task Force also really, really wanted to do something about single-use plastics, and it kind that you know it was very sad to have to tell them that right. we can't tell what to do until the state decides whether they're going to act or not so right. we're going to get a a, a wishy-washy uh, recommendation from the climate action task force uh, but we want to continue to to promote the state taking action on this yes. all right anyone else all right, seeing that we have no further comments, let's go ahead and move on to city manager remarks. Anything else? No comments, Mayor Council. Mr. May, attorney remarks. No comments, Mayor. All right, do we have a motion to adjourn in the spirit of? I no move to. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's all right. We move to adjourn. All right, it's been mo the, the motion has been made by a rare show of uh, solidarity. partner solidarity with <laughs> council members Christensen and Martin. I shall second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We are adjourned according to six of us, and ironically, Councilmember Peck is absent.